important city and seaport in the province of Natal, South Africa. It lies between the green hills of Zululand and the blue waters of the Indian Ocean. The whalers spend as little time as possible in port. And as the city of Durban drops below the horizon, the ship enters the world of whales and whalermen. Every day, ships of the whaling fleet start out in quest of their quarry, steaming into a vast expanse of sky and water to do the specific job for which they were built. Everything is ship-shaped, including the marker buoys, which the men have lashed to the rigging with an efficiency born of long experience. Once out to sea, the charges of black powder are loaded into the shell cases. From now on, there will be few idle moments. There will be no time for preparation once whales are sighted, and there must be no doubt no delays and no hitches that might spell failure at best, danger and disaster at worst. The ship settles down to a time-honored routine as a new watch comes on duty. The catcher may be at sea for three or four days or longer, depending on the catch. While at sea, each member of the crew has his appointed duties. There are 12 men on board. Most of them are Norwegians whose fathers and grandfathers were whalermen. All are anxious for success, as each man shares in the profit. If after days of vigilance, no whale is sighted, it's a personal loss to them all. The loading of the gun up on the bow is a meticulous and skillful operation. The harpoon has four prongs or grapples that open inside the whale and prevent it from being pulled out. It is lashed into place to keep it in position until it is fired. Attached to it is a long nylon rope, an inch and a half thick, immensely strong and amazingly flexible. The harpoon head contains an explosive grenade with a two second delay to kill the whale quickly and humanely. On whalers, the captain is the gunner, and Captain Carlson, among the greatest whalermen in the world, watches these preparations with lynx-eyed attention. With the loading of the harpoon completed, the gun is swung pointing forward and fixed in a safe position where premature firing will do no damage. And finally, the charge of powder goes into the breach. The correct loading of the gun is the result of long experience. Everything is ready, and as the hours pass, the ship's focal point shifts upward. From time to time, each whalerman glances up to the crow's nest high overhead, where keen eyes sweep the sea in search of the telltale plumes of spray that indicate the location of a surfacing whale. Look to the crow's nest at the cry of the lookout, and immediately the helmsman calls for more speed to reduce the distance between the hunter and the quarry. With her increased speed, the sturdy little catcher takes a more severe buffeting from the sea, while on deck, trained eyes try to identify the type of whale sighted. It's a school of sperm whales. All speed is on. As Captain Carlson orders mate Toby Hockerstad forward to the gun to give him more experience in becoming a captain and a gunner. Hockerstad moves quickly along the catwalk from bridge to bow with an outward calmness that hides his excitement. From now on, he is in full command. Not only the gun, but the entire ship is under his direction. Pitted against his calmness and skill is the sperm whale that can dive for an hour at a time leaving Hawkerstad to anticipate its next move. And now he has picked his target, 
a large sperm of about 50 tons. Hawkerstad signals a hit. If the whale isn't killed immediately, a second harpoon is fired. When it's all over, the prize must be secured. And it's all hands on deck as the winches start hauling in the cable to bring the whale alongside. A hollow spike attached to an air hose is driven into the dead whale. Then the compressed air is turned on in order to make the whale float, whether the catcher leaves it or takes it with her. This particular whale is to be left for a while so the marker boys and flag are on life. The compressed air is turned off and the air hose removed. Then to enable the ship to find the whale later, the marker boys and flag are put over the side and attached to the whale. When the catcher returns from further hunting, flag will be visible for a long distance. With this initial success to hearten her crew, the catcher steams away and resumes the hunt. On deck, the preparations begin all over again. Steel cables are re-stowed and the nylon cable that snakes out after the harpoon is recoiled. Thoroughly and meticulously, the crew gets ready for the next feverish chase to be heralded from the crow's nest with a cry, Thar she blows. For mile after mile, the catcher lumbers on, enveloped in uneventful routine. Monotony is banished, this time by a psi whale, a member of the baleen family. The same reaction, the same excitement, the call for speed, and again the little catcher takes a buffeting as she enters the chase. The gun is loaded and everything is ready, but the engine training for the last knot of speed. This time, Captain Carlson himself takes over. It's a hit, and a fine psi whale is added to the long tally that has made Carlson one of the world's greatest gunners. It's good news for his crew, and they set about securing the catch with a good will. It's interesting to notice the spots or blotches on the psi whale, a marking that distinguishes it from other types of whales. Sometimes as the air is forced into a whale, it works its way toward the head. In seeking an outlet, it blows up what appears to be the tongue, but what is actually fibrous tissue, and a huge balloon emerges from the whale's mouth. When the ship left the side whale, Crewmen little thought they were moving on toward a human drama. There were no indications. The new watch came on to do their spell, and with the success already attained, the chances were our ship had enjoyed its share of luck. Then a finback whale broke the surface. There she blows! After the lookout had spotted him, there were the same reactions on board, except this time there was the grave risk of foundering when going at full speed in a rough sea. Up on the bridge, Carlson had to think of the danger to himself and his crew before making a decision. There was trouble ahead. The seas were becoming rougher. 
And seaworthy though she was, as the speed was increased, the little catcher began to take a pounding. That 80-ton finback whale was going to involve a tremendous risk. The odds were enormous. The gunner was courting disaster. If he were washed from that tiny bow platform, he would be crushed by the ship or cut to pieces by the lashing propellers. No wonder Carlson hesitated. Was the prize worth the risk? Full speed was ordered. Carlson had accepted the challenge. He went forward to the gun, tried to anticipate the whale's next move, and ordered a change of course. It was a decision born of great courage. The crew gladly obeyed the captain's orders, but as the catcher plunged forward on this desperate gamble, the situation became worse. Up forward, Carlson was fitting his courage and strength against the terrifying might of the sea. He'd get that whale, no matter what the risk. This finback whale, 80 feet long, was shot under conditions that would have defied lesser men. Though mortally wounded, it put up a struggle until the desperate encounter was quickly ended by a second harpoon. had been high, but Carlson had gambled and won, and all the crew would share in the reward. All that remained was to get the prize back to port and collect the bounty. This time, as the winch stopped, the huge binback whale was secured alongside, ready to be towed back to Durban. Catcher gets underway without waiting for the huge flukes to be trimmed down to make the whale more manageable. It has been a satisfactory trip, most satisfactory. The course is set to pick up the psi whale shot earlier, and as the catcher nears its approximate position, a pinpoint in an endless ocean, binoculars scan the seas for the marker flag. But now the dead whale has company. Seagulls are feasting on any tasty morsels they can detach. It may be they are feeding on part of the whale or on parasitic worms whose whale-worrying days are now over. And the gulls are not the only visitors, for huge sharks gorge themselves on chunks they rip from the whale's carcass. was not shot to feed the vultures and jackals of the sea. And as the catcher comes alongside, the flag and the marker boys are retrieved and the whales secured for towing. The fluke tips are tossed to the scavengers of the sea. And finally, the catch is marked to keep the record straight at the factory. With two fine whales securely attached alongside, the whale catcher resumes her return voyage. A 
distant flag marks the sperm whale that was shot first. The sperm is a strange mammal which feeds on octopus, squid, and cuttlefish. Being smaller than the psi or the finback whale, it is more easily handled. And almost as soon as the marker flag is recovered, it's full steam ahead, this time for Durban. Captain Carlson is happy. In fact, everyone is happy. And just to emphasize the good fortune of this trip, the ship meets a sister catcher, which has reached her time limit at sea. She is heading for port with no whales. It goes like that. She has had no luck while the escort of gulls wheeling overhead proclaims that our ship has been more fortunate. And right now, Carlson, who doesn't often have the time to indulge in such whimsy, admires the beauty of the evening. Yes, the weather is good and all's well. Next morning, Durban appears dead ahead. And soon the ship is passing close to the whaling station where the catch will be processed. Whaling is a large industry in itself and of vital importance to many other South African industries. The whale is an air-breathing, warm-blooded mammal that lives in many parts of the world's oceans. Because it has always been extremely valuable to man, this huge creature has been hunted and killed by him for centuries. Whales fall into two classes, toothless, or baleen whales, such as the psi, and tooth whales, of which the sperm is one. The teeth of the sperm, a type of ivory, are sold as souvenirs. When whales are hauled from the sea, it becomes apparent what enormous mammals they really are. This bull whale is 80 feet long and weighs approximately a ton for each foot of its length, a mountain of flesh and bone. The baleen, or whale bone, of the toothless whale is really a sieve that catches the small creatures and plankton of the sea on which they feed. It is remarkable that a diet of such microscopic creatures should sustain the largest and most powerful animal in the world. At the whaling station, they were standing by for the ship's arrival, and one of the whales was soon on its way to the processing plant, for if the extraction is delayed, whale oil deteriorates. The whale is regarded as an abundant source of valuable raw material. Oil from the whale's liver is used medicinally. Certain parts of the meat are for human consumption, finding their way to many dinner tables. The rest of the meat is rendered for oil, and the residue provides animal feed. The bone is crushed for bone meal and used as a fertilizer, also for feeding cattle and poultry. Another thing recovered from the carcass is the harpoon that killed the whale. The baleen, or whale bone, is still used for stiffeners in ladies' dresses, to make bristles for brushes, and one specialized use is to make the plumes that adorn the helmets of the Royal English Guard. The most valuable product is oil, about half of which comes from the blubber, the fat just beneath the skin. The greatest use of whale oil is in the making of soaps and margarine, and the oil from the sperm whale is used as a lubricant for engineering instruments. South Africa is fortunate to be blessed with the finest offshore whaling grounds in the world, and added to her other rich endowments of natural resources, both directly and indirectly, whaling plays an important role in the economy of this commonwealth. Whaling is a big industry 
that depends on the hardy men who go down to the sea in little ships.